Jesus said there is no marriage after this life. If Mormons really believed that, we would be doing something else. Stay tuned for Polygamy, What Love Is This? Polyandry is a practice that a few Mormon leaders were involved with, a practice that I didn't know anything about. You know, I didn't either. When I, I did, was growing up. I didn't up. even know the word. I didn't came know. Out I didn't either. Of the church. And the word is defined as, quote, polygamy in which a woman has more than one husband. So we're talking the other side yeah. of the story here. And Joseph Smith married other men's wives while they were married to and living with other husbands. Brigham Young also married other men's wives. And there were other men of early Mormonism who married women who were legally married to other men and did not get a legal divorce. And we're going to cover some of those men uh, in this segment. Another word for this is bigamy. And God's word for this is adultery. From the official LDS Church website, we quote. Yeah, it's interesting that they would finally admit to this. Finally, People were huh? probably excommunicated for even thinking this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, they were. But these are one of, I guess, one of the the uh, gospel essay mm -hmm. topics. They uh, finally talked. Uh, plural marriage it. in Kirtland and Nauvoo. It says, following his marriage to Louisa Beeman and before he married other single women, Joseph Smith was sealed to a number of women who were already married. Now, this is the official website yeah. that we're quoting this from. The LDS website estimates that Joseph Smith married somewhere between 12 and 14 women who were already married. In Sacred Loneliness, Todd Compton estimates 11 women. Yeah. And then he, he mentions maybe three or four more who there's not enough information to, to confirm that he was married to them. But he publishes all the footnotes and all the references, personal journals to back up his information. Yeah. Now, we wonder why would a man allow Joseph Smith to marry his wife? Now, granted, there were some of the women's husbands yeah. that were totally unaware Didn't know about uh, that it. Joseph Smith was married to his wife. But some of them did know it and they didn't seem to object. Now, perhaps it was because they had the same attitude that several years later, Jedediah Grant, who was second counselor to Brigham Young, had about giving his wife to the Mormon president. In his sermon given on February 19th, 1854, Grant said he would give his wife or any of his wives to Brigham if he asked for them. <laughs> well, There's he had, <laughs> had enough of them that it didn't matter if he lost one or two. Uh, I they're just get, or you can always property. go out and get more. <laughs> they're just property anyway. Right, right. right. Not a lot yeah. of love there, I didn't don't have, think. Didn't have much to say about it. There. Yeah. But there, there seemed to be, in my opinion, as we look through this, where they claim to be the kingdom of God, there seemed to be some very odd and, and perverted reasoning behind mm -hmm. the, poly, the polyandrous marriages of those early Mormons. Yeah. Now, first of all, Joseph Smith paved the way by announcing that all marriages that were not performed by the Mormon priesthood were invalid. Now, this is taken from Richard Van Wagner's Mormon Polygamy, A History, page 42. Smith viewed as invalid those marriages not sealed by his blessing, claiming sole responsibility for binding and unbinding marriages on earth and in heaven. He did not consider it necessary to obtain civil marriage licenses or divorce decrees. Whenever he deemed it appropriate, he could release a woman from her earthly marriage and seal her to himself or another with no stigma of adultery. Well, that opened the door wide, didn't it? Yeah, that does. And that's a perfect way for Joseph Smith to manipulate and mind control his followers. Mm. But why didn't they protest? There, now, there seems to be an ultra-elitism in Mormonism. There was then, and there still seems to be to some extent today. Yeah. So being propositioned by the leader would have been a pretty big deal for the yeah, woman at that time, prophet. I think. Yeah. yeah. With all the charisma and everything. <laughs> With all the marriages invalid in the eyes of certain Mormons, all females now would be fair game to the Mormon polygamous male, and that's the way it played out in several instances. And it's strange as, as we said, that so much illicit sexual activity took place in early Mormon marriages, even though they considered chastity an important part of their religion, and adultery as an unforgivable sin. Yeah, it's even mentioned in Doctrine and Covenants 42.25, 
But he that has committed adultery and repents with all his heart and forsaketh it and doeth it no more, thou shalt forgive. But if he doeth it again, he shall not be forgiven, but shall be cast out. And there's it. That, that's their scriptures. One it's, shot. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Adultery, if committed the second time, was unforgivable. Yet adultery is sexual activity with another person outside of their monogamous marriage covenant. Mm -hmm. And that's what all these early Mormons did. Joseph F. Smith said this. Yeah, in the teachings of the presidents of the church, he said, We hold that sexual sin is second only to the shedding of innocent blood in the category of personal crimes. We proclaim as the word of the Lord, Thou shalt not commit adultery, from Exodus 20, 14. He that looketh on a woman to lust after her, or if any shall commit adultery in their hearts, they shall not have the spirit, but, sh but shall deny the faith, taken from Doctrine and Covenant 63.16. Now, these are all quotes from their so-called prophets right. who have supposedly divine intelligence. Now, monogamous marriage is the only marriage that has been initiated and recognized and condoned by God. Monogamy was his plan from the beginning, and Jesus affirmed that monogamy was the plan. And 1 yeah. Corinthians 7, 2 also affirms monogamy only. But Joseph Smith changed God's mind and extended the marriage boundaries that God had set in place. Now, Smith could marry any single woman who would say yes to him, and even the married women were fair game. Hmm. He changed the rules, and the strange thing is many people never questioned him or his activities. That is strange. <laughs> and many embraced and followed his immorality themselves. The most well-known and probably the most tragic of all the Polly Andry stories was Zena Huntington and her legal husband, Henry Jacobs. Now, we've told their story in previous programs yeah. in, yeah. in some detail, so we won't go into detail today. But as a summary, we quote from Nauvoo Polygamy. Yeah, it, on page 73 and 74, it says, Six months after marrying Louisa Beeman, Smith completed his courtship of the Huntington sisters, Zena Huntington Jacobs and Presendia Huntington Buell in 1841. When they married Smith, both were adult women, 20 and 31 years old, respectively. Okay, so both sisters yep. were also married to other men, married to and living with their other husband when they married Joseph Smith. Now, Zena had experienced a huge conflict between Joseph Smith's marriage proposal and her love for Henry Jacob. At first, she refused Joseph Smith's proposal, and she and Henry went ahead and got married on March 7th of 1841. But Zena later wrote that within a few months after her marriage to Henry, Joseph Smith sent a message to her telling his infamous tale about an angel with a sword drawn threatening his life mm -hmm. if he didn't get with the program of polygamy. We've all heard that one. <laughs> and he was already a polygamist by that time anyway, so That's that was a, a double deceit. Now the angel was late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Something. He didn't know much. <laughs> Anyway, she, so, so Zena was duly coerced into an adulterous marriage with Smith. And in October of the same year that she had married Henry Jacobs, she also married Joseph Smith. And she was seven months pregnant with Henry's child. Hmm. We quote. Taken from Todd Compton's In Sacred Loneliness, Henry Jacobs knew of this wedding, and he and Zena continued to live as man and wife in the same home. He believed that whatever the prophet did was right. Henry was sent on several missions and frequently wrote home. Not, a lo not long after Smith's death in 1844, Zena became one of Brigham Young's plural wives, but still lived with Henry. In May, and I think this is 1846, Zena began to live openly as Brigham's plural wife and did so until Young died. In spite of Henry's struggle with his beloved wife's plural marriage, he continued to love her and would say nothing negative about Smith or Young. He did complain about being so alone in Miss Zena. He wrote, All is right according to the law of the celestial kingdom of our God, Joseph. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's pretty blasphemous there, yeah. calling Joseph Smith his God. At any rate, Henry Jacobs lived a painful and lonely yeah. life, knowing that his wife was, uh, that he loved was also living with Joseph Smith and then later with Brigham Young. Crazy. We wonder why he never asked the question, would a just and loving and holy God really require this kind of sexually 
in sexual immorality among his people. And of course, the straight up one word answer to that is no. Henry, Zena, and all the others were deceived by Joseph Smith's false pretense of being a prophet, as he always used the phrase, thus saith the Lord. Now, the LDS and the Mormon polygamists today continue in that same blindness as they follow their false prophets. This is blindness that occurs when people follow the laws of men and religion instead of embracing the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith also married Zena's sister, Prescindia, who was also a married woman. And yes, sex was involved in some, if not all, these marriages, we quote yeah. from wife number 19. Yes. Not all people thought Joseph's supposed priesthood authority allowed him to behave the way he did. Anna Eliza Young, who had been married to Brigham Young, charged that Joseph Smith was guilty of adultery. At least somebody had came, <laughs> somebody to, came to that, that. conclusion. Yeah. Joseph not only paid his addresses to the young and unmarried women, but he sought spiritual alliance with many married ladies. He taught them that all former marriages were null and void and that they were at perfect liberty to make another choice of a husband. The marriage covenants were not binding because they were ratified only by Gentile laws. Consequently, all the women were free. One woman said to me not very long since while giving me some of her experiences in polygamy, the greatest trial I ever endured in my life was living with my husband and deceiving him by receiving Joseph's attentions whenever he chose to come to me. This woman and others whose experience has been very similar are among the very best women in the church. They are as pure-minded and virtuous women as any in the world. They were seduced under the guise of religion. Some of these women have since said they did not know who was the father of their children. This is not to be wondered at, for after Joseph's declaration annulling all Gentile marriages, the greatest promiscuity was practiced, and indeed, all sense of morality seemed to have been lost by a portion, at least, of the church. And that pretty much tells what was going Sad on. Tale. And, yeah. and you can't sanitize that. <laughs> there, there's no way you can Clorox that into being a good practice no, and, or holy. Yeah, and I'm sure this is tr very honest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, according to the journals and so forth, um, it is... Um, confirmed by other journals. Yeah. Now we have a list here of the 11 women yeah, that, that we know in were, Sacred Loneliness mentions right. that Joseph Smith was married to. And then there's a list of a few others that he possibly <laughs> would have been married to. And these are all women with other husbands. Yeah, Lucinda Pendleton, 1838. And these are the dates that they were married. Uh, married. <laughs> Zena Huntington Jacobs, 1841, and her sister Prescindia Huntington Buell, 1841. Sylvia Sessions in 1842, Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner in 1842, Patty Bartlett Sessions 1842, Marinda Nancy Johnson 1842, Elizabeth Durfee 1842, Sarah Kingsley Cleveland in 1842, and then Ruth Vose Sayers in 1843, and Elvira Cowles Holmes 1843. And the other possible married women were Vienna Jacques, I guess, Mrs. G in 1842, Mrs. Taylor, and a Mary Heron Snyder. Okay, and there's not enough list. information. <laughs> there's some information that uh, indicates they were married to him, yeah. but not nothing no, so that they could... documented. Right. Yeah. But notice all the women he married in 1842. Yeah, 1842. It's just bam, bam, bam. He just married one wife. And this is just the married women. It's not the single women he was marrying at the same time. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah. This is a very busy time he for him, wasn't He was very busy it? boy, yeah. yeah. Gee. And he also made, and we've talked about this in certainly other shows, but he made several marriage proposals to several women who turned him down, and no doubt there are some that we don't even know of. Now, um, John Taylor's wife, Leonora, was propositioned by Joseph Smith. Heber C. Kimball's wife, Valet, was demanded by Joseph Smith. Orson Pratt's wife, Sarah, was propositioned by him. William Law's wife, Jane, was also propositioned by Joseph Smith. And Hiram Kimball's wife, Sarah, was approached by Joseph Smith as well. Well, now, these women all rejected him, but the sad part of all this, or part of the sad part, is that the husbands of these women were all close peers and had a, cl cl a close church yeah. relationship with Joseph Smith, and yet he went behind their backs and tried to marry their wives. 
There's no way, there's no twist. There's no Mormon justification, no explanation that can possibly position this to be a good practice. <laughs> it's sad. It's surprising, really. It, it is shocking. It could, yeah, that he would be that bold and not worried, really. I guess he had he such confidence such confidence in his calling as a prophet that people were just going to... Or did he, maybe he just knew he all had, had them all hoodwinked and wasn't really afraid of... of oh. you know. And then some of these, I guess, that turned him down, he, he, you know, he, he threatened, threatened. threatened with eternal punishment or right, something. Right, and, and threatened yeah. to ruin their character. Yeah, yeah. Now, the Bible tells us that bad company corrupts good character, <laughs> and that certainly is proven true by the men who followed the awful example set by Joseph Smith. Now we're going to talk about Brigham Young's polyandry. He also married other men's wives. He took Zena Huntington to wife after Joseph Smith died, and Zena was still married to Henry Jacobs. Augusta Cobb was uh, Brigham Young's fourth wife, and she married him without a divorce from her legal husband. We yeah. quote. Now this is from Jim Whitefield, Mormon Delusion, page 159. As in some other instances, Young simply converted and absconded with another man's wife on the basis that Young did not recognize, in this case Augusta's first marriage, as valid in the sight of his God. Upon her conversion to Mormonism, Augusta simply left her husband and followed Young from Boston to Nauvoo. She married him later the same year. Several years after she married Young in 1847, Henry Cobb eventually divorced Augusta, I guess officially. <laughs> Official, legally, yeah. yeah. So Brigham Young also married as his 20th wife, Adam Leitner's wife, Mary, and she had also been married to Joseph Smith while she was still married to Adam. So she's just going through husbands like Joseph Smith was going through wives. Yeah. There are eight other married women that Brigham Young, without benefit of a legal divorce from her legal husband, married as plural wives. Heber C. Kimball is another Mormon leader who practiced polyandry. He married, <coughs> excuse me, Two of Joseph Smith's already married women after Smith was killed. Those women continued to live with their legal husbands <clears throat> while being married to Joseph Smith and Heber Kimball. They were, <clears throat> my word, <clears throat> pardon me. <laughs> they were Sylvia Sessions and Prescindia Huntington Buell, Zena Huntington's sister. Heber Kimball was also married to four other women who already had legal husbands. Now, of course, we can't neglect Parley P. Pratt <laughs> and his polyandrous marriage, which eventually led to his death. Yeah. While in San Francisco, Pratt convinced Eleanor, the wife of Hector McLean, to accept the Mormon faith and to elope with him to Utah as his plural wife. Trouble was, Eleanor was married and the mother of three children, hmm. a girl and two boys. And we're going to do a more detailed show about him oh, in the future. So she did. She left with Pratt and married him in Salt Lake City without getting a legal divorce from her husband, Hector. Parley P. Pratt was later murdered by Eleanor's outraged husband. The Bible <laughs> warns us that the wages of sin is death. That Pratt should have known that. In his book, Mormon Delusion, Jim Whitefield discusses polyandry at length. Yeah, first of all, though, a section, Doctrine and Covenants, section 5821, let no man break the laws of the land, for he that keepeth the laws of God hath no need to break the laws of the land. There you go. Joseph but Smith and Brigham Young both stated that they lived above the law. Young added that the saints did too, which again contradicts the scripture quoted above. However, they could not live above the law and publish scripture stating that God did not allow the things they were doing. Either God or Joseph Smith was a liar. There is only one real candidate and only one valid conclusion. The evidence is irrefutable. The church argues that lies were necessary. They conveniently overlook the fact that the Christian God whom they claim to worship is supposedly perfect and could not allow that. Ergo, Smith was a fraud. There can be no question about it, unfortunately for the church. The rest of the world fully understands what adultery means and that is exactly what was practiced. That was good. And there it is. <laughs> that was good. I wanted to quote all that because it was so good and appropriate. Yeah, Many people who defend uh, Mormon polyandry claim that sexual relations were not involved. 
that these married women were shielded to him for eternal marriages in the heavenly realms, which would be eternity only. Yeah. Yet many of the wives who married these second husbands confessed that their marriages were for both time yeah. and eternity, and time means here on this earth before they die, which of course means the marriage bed, or why would they do <laughs> it? Else, <yeah. laughs> Polygamists today also assign and reassign plural wives back and forth between husbands, especially the FLDS, although other polygamy groups are guilty of doing it too. Warren Jeffs bragged to his followers that he alone was God's mouthpiece on earth, and they were warned to follow him in perfect obedience and keep that keep sweet attitude. Mm. When Jeffs was suspicious of someone's attitude or, or motive, he would take a man's wives from him and assign them to other husbands and then send the man away to repent from afar. The <laughs> females had no say whatsoever in their reassignments. Many times the husband never saw his wives or children again. One incident in the AUB polygamy group was a child bride who complained about her husband's perversions. So the leader just sealed her to another man at the drop of a hat. No divorce, no annulment, just transfer of ownership. Of course, all these sealings, which is what they call celestial marriage, really has no legal and certainly no spiritual value whatsoever. Jesus Christ said, there are no marriages after this life. And if the Mormons and polygamists believed what Jesus taught, we would not be talking about this right now. Regarding the Mormon religion, a statement made by Vladimir Lenin is proven accurate. He said, quote, a lie told often enough becomes truth, end quote. This was repeated in different words during the Nazi era. Yeah, this is Joseph, I think it's Goebbels on the big lie. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic, and or military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent, for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie, and thus by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Wow. <laughs> and remember what, what the, some of the Mormon prophets have said about the truth? Yeah. Ballard? Was, oh. was it Ballard? No, it was... Um, oh. Packer. Packer, he yeah. He said the truth is not always useful. Right. <laughs> and, and he's just saying the same thing in different, in different words. words. Do they even realize what they're, what yeah. they're saying? Yeah. <laughs> in this case, the power behind the big lie is Mormonism. The truth is as revealed in the Bible is, as he said, a mortal and spiritual enemy of the big lie of Joseph Smith, that polygamy was a prerequisite to eternal salvation. Yeah. They all believe that the, this lie is the truth. But God says this about the truth. Yeah, from Second Th Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Notice how important it is to love the truth. Refusing to love the truth is certain rejection by God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. yeah. And, and through the Bible, the truth is given by God to us, so rejecting it is rejecting God. Jesus said this in yeah, John. John 18, 37 and 38. For this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And of course, Pilate asks, what is truth? Isn't that profound? <laughs> yeah. The embodiment of truth was fair, staring him in the face, and Pilate didn't even recognize it. And it's the same way today. A truth isn't relative, or truth, truth isn't relative, as right. some people claim it is. <laughs> yeah. And truth is knowable, and it's easy to find. It's, it, but for many in Mormonism, it's so difficult to even search for and to accept. On page 118 of Mormon Delusion, Whitefield writes this. It is incredible to think that polygamy, with all its history and problems, along with tens of thousands of fundamentalist Mormons, still 
practicing it all came about because Joseph Smith got caught in his adultery. Isn't that something? <laughs> and of course, he's referring to the time sure. that, that Emma found them in the barn yeah. with Danny Alger and <laughs> in the hay. And, and Smith's unfaithfulness to their, uh, with their 16-year-old housemaid has caused uncountable ruined lives through the decades after that. Don't ever think that our actions cannot cause historical and horrific consequences. Most polygamists then and now believe that they're doing God's will. And some in polygamy suffer such profound poverty that most people who are watching this show right now can't even imagine the poverty they go through. They suffer loneliness and coercion and spiritual oppression, but they believe they're earning God's love. But that isn't God's will for them. We've quoted this before, and it's relevant again. Someone said, these poor people following this so-called prophet, all they were looking for was God, but instead found this monster. And that describes Joseph Smith mm. and his polygamy and his polyandry and his false gospel. Yeah, and <clears throat> do you, this practice of pulling out in, in current days, where the prophet, so to speak, can pull out people from one marriage and put them into another. Is that their way around polyandry now, or do they actually practice some form of polyandry at all? Uh, I think it's just disintegrated, you know. Uh -huh. I, I, I probably don't even think, I think they probably don't even think about how to get around. It. They just yeah. do what they've decided they want to do. The Bible says that evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, and they've just gone from bad to worse. <laughs> In what they're doing. And the other thing I thought of kind of as we were going through that, you read the word keep sweet. Yeah. What does that do to you when you hear that? They didn't use that so they much on us. That. They, that was mostly an FLDS, but it's also some of the other polygamy okay. groups use it. Because I can imagine some former LDS people or uh, former polygamists would hear that word and just cringe. And, and there are some words that they used on us that I do cringe with. That's not heard. one because we weren't used, it oh. wasn't used with us that much. But I have talked to some FLDS yeah. uh, that say well, that. They of do. course, I inv interview a lot of former Mormons right. who come out and come to Christ and the Bible. But this coming out of polygamy is just a whole other level, isn't it? It's a it's whole other layer of It's another layer. Guilt and, it's the same ugliness. It's yeah. the same guilt and shame and, and brainwashing. But, yeah, yeah it's, it's the same, mm. same pain. And I love this, what you said. They were all looking for God but instead find this. No. And that's what's so sad, Earl, because these people, the polygamists as well as the Mormons, think they're pleasing God, and they're not. Yeah. They haven't even researched for Earn, themselves what it takes to earning please God. Earning our way to heaven. Yeah. yeah. No. Sad. Thank you so much. You bet. You know, in Ephesians 5:17, it says, quote, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Well, we are to understand what God's will is for us. We know polyandry is not God's will for us, and it never was. We know polygamy is not and never was God's will. God wants us to live intelligently, not in ignorance of his will. We're not supposed to trust what someone else says God wants for us and never personally know the will of the Lord. The leaders of every Mormon group are puppeteering their members into living their will for them rather than teaching them how to find God's will for their lives because they fear losing power over their members. But the only authentic power is God's, and He has not delegated His authority over us to anyone but Jesus Christ. And we pray that you will choose the truth, and Jesus is the truth. It's that simple. Thanks for watching. <laughs>